Um, so yeah, I brought around a bit. Uh, Where's the soil, soil from? I picked up from near where I live. The reason is it smells healthy. If you have a little sniff of that, it's got a really earthy aroma. You can smell the fungi in there and whatever. Just like that. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Do you want this on? Yes. 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 Okay. My name's Alex Waller. I am a visiting professor at AUSN. I'd, I'd like to talk today about science and the ethics and possibly a little bit about education regarding soil conservation. So, well, uh, uh -huh, I see. What I'd like to do, I'm not used to this um, high tech <laughs> presentation. What, I, what I'd like to talk about today is what's so special about soil? Um, how can we define soil health, some of the functions and ecosystem services that it contributes to? How that relates to human well being and the sustainable development goals? Um, talk about not only this um, soil degradation and land degradation and erosion, but also how it can be regenerated and how that links to carbon sequestration and consumerism. Some international initiatives and principles and policies related to human being human well-being or being human well perhaps and the potential to change and reduce soil erosion or soil land degradation through education. So I, I've brought a few books with me because as I've been learning about this or reading, researching about this, I've been inspired by this book Darrell, I don't know if you want to see yep. books called Global Soil Proverbs, and I thought I'd share a few with you yeah. if you'd like to. Thank you. So, a, no a nation that destroys itself, sorry, a nation that destroys its soils destroys itself. I'm sure you've heard that by Roosevelt from the 30s. The land will be as mankind is. In Mexico, several hundred years ago when the Spanish arrived, they were impressed by um, a technology where they artificially grow plants on lakes and because the population in the area was very, very dense and they created this sort of floating soil structures. But I think that that's maybe a more suspicious proverb considering how we treat the soil today. From Ireland, the ground knows, dumb though it may be, dumb perhaps in silent, or dumb as in stupid, but the ground seems to know. Perhaps again that's very relevant today as we think of growing amounts of soil erosion and land degradation. From Italy, the heart hardens the same way the soil does, you know. As we go through traumas in life, sometimes people's hearts harden as the land is traumatised, the soil hardens. Manual labour of the land preserves the quality of the soil and the health of the individual. I like that one because it relates human well-being to our roots in the soil, our dependence on the soil. What you give to the soil is what the soil will give to you in return from Nigeria. On, on earth it's soil and in the sky it's God from Pakistan. Reminding ourselves that we are on earth, you know, we are rooted here. And just to perhaps encourage regenerative agriculture, manure is not holy, but it works miracles, or perhaps a more down to earth French one, the god of soil is manure. The reason I include all those is to show that all the way around the world, people for 
hundreds, thousands of years and realize our dependence on soil. And perhaps as we migrate more towards cities, we become more distant from our roots. The soil care network, um, which we started in the last two or three years after conference in Sheffield, um, have this on their website. The soils are the life of our planet. They are the spaces where all life, human and otherwise, is continually made and sustained. Soils take care of us all, we must take care of them in return. And that's fairly clear, fairly blatant. You know, if we neglect our soils, as in the quote at the end of the last speaker, um, if we neglect our environment, we'll have no society. Um, the IPC report, the International Panel on Climate Change, shows two or from plenty of interesting statistics, but particularly, although these graphs aren't very clear on here, and I apologise for that, this incredibly steep one shows more than 800, probably much more than that, because it actually goes off the scale of the graph, uh, increase in inorganic nitrogen fertiliser use since 1961, up until 2016, I think it was. Um, 2017. 100% uh, in, increase in water irrigation is this very steep curve. And on this one, it is 200% increase in population living in, in drought stress areas. The International Union of Soil Sciences on their website it has several banners that flash up with interesting facts about soil. There are a hundred thousand different types of soil around the world. <coughs> in a handful of soil, a handful, less than what we've got in that little container wherever it's gone, in near the coffee probably. Um, <laughs> it contains billions, a handful contains billions of living organisms, microorganisms. Five tons of animal life can live in one hectare of soil. It's more than an elephant, yeah. So if it's more than an elephant, it must demand a lot of food. So it needs a lot of carbon-based compounds in there. Soil carbon is the largest terrestrial pool of carbon. We often hear about how it can dissolve in the oceans, how it can be, how carbon can be trapped in various other ways. But there's this massive resource available within the soil. And just to remind ourselves of what healthy soil looks like, it's full of decaying roots, leaves, other plant material. It's got fungi. I'm no mycologist. I took this photo up in Mae Hong Son, northern Thailand. They are a type of fungi, but I have no idea which one they are. And if you look carefully, I mentioned about insects being in the soil, of course they're larvae, but these are attracting as a some sort of bee here. Full of bacteria, full of life. Um, Libby did an experiment probably 200 years or more ago showing the mineral content of Earth. And I think largely since that time there's been an emphasis on fertility of soil being mineral based, the NPK content being primarily important. There's various definitions of what soil fertility or soil productivity. But I'm referring really to soil health. Soil health is defined as the continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. This definition speaks to the importance of managing soils so they're sustainable for future generations. Thirty years, nearly 30 years ago, there was an FAO 
survey of soils, the global soil assessment, showing how particularly that within the um, across Asia and across parts of Africa, Africa this scale this a particular vulnerability to water and wind erosion. Pimental in the 90s quoted a figure of 30 tons per hectare per year soil loss to um, erosion. Perhaps since then the estimates have been a little bit more conservative, perhaps not quite as high as that. Um, within the first decade of the 21st century they are reassessed perhaps to 35 to 30 PG per year, but there's a, again an increase from 35.0 to 35.9, which is a 2.5% increase in the erosion. <coughs> so, land degradation. I was interested in the last presentation, sorry to cross talk a little bit, but Thanks. you mentioned that it was land development for housing. Yes. And I wondered if it's really development. <laughs> <laughs> land degradation, a negative trend in land condition caused by direct or indirect human processes, including anthropogenic climate change expressed in long-term reduction or loss of at least one of the following. Biological productivity, ecological integrity or value to humans. Soil degradation refers to a subset of land degradation processes that directly affect soil. Soil provides or soil helps to provide a number of ecosystem services, supporting services such as <coughs> nutrient cycling, provisioning services. It's, it's, it's so integral to um, fresh water, soil and water, um, very, very closely related. Regulating services such as um, climate and disease. And I'm not sure if soil is completely, how strongly related it is to cultural, but it is to some extent related to cultural services. Those ecosystem services obviously relate very closely to many of the SDGs. No hunger, no zero hunger, no poverty, clean water and sanitation. Relates to energy through biofuels, sustainable economic growth, as we've just been hearing about, possibly sustainable cities, and particularly number 15, life on land. Um, the soil functions, <coughs> the soil functions in the pink area here enable many of these ecosystem services in the next sphere and those obviously impact on so many of these 17 SDGs. As I say, particularly the 15th goal, by 2030, so SDG 15.3, by 2030, to combat desertification, restore degraded land and soil, including land affected by desertification, drought and floods, and to strive to achieve a land degradation neutral world. So the impacts that we have on soil include increasing erosion through regular ploughing, etc., compaction of soils, contamination of soils through pesticides, through leaching heavy metals from the mining, release of other toxic substances, acidification of soils. We do a lot 
we take a lot from the soil, but we seem to give very little to it. The causes of soil degradation from the 1991 FAO report. Deforestation, overgrazing, agricultural activities, it's very broad, domestic overexploitation and industrial activities. The mechanisms include erosion, as mentioned already, by water and wind, chemical deterioration, including minerals, organic the soil organic matter depletion, becoming more salty salinization, acidification, and various other forms of pollution. Physical degradation like compaction, etc. I've got a slide here, and again this is from Mei Hong Song, surprisingly close. You can see in the background there's some primary forest, which is where I got the photo from earlier. Um, many of the hill hill road peoples, and it's not just here, but it's in many places around the world, that uh, inadvertently, as they are using converting the land from forest to agricultural land, particularly on very steep hills, you can see the gradient over here is clearly more than 30%, incredibly high runoff. And so I took this photo to, sh to show the gradient this particular hill side. And you can see the gullies. Um, you can see it just being harvested, crops being grown and harvested here like maize, corn. Um, within a couple in a very short time, the mineral content in that soil at least has decreased, let alone the biodiversity within the soil. So the soil is made up of approximately 25% air, 25% water, about 45% minerals, and hopefully 5% of organic matter. Those are approximate. But it just from this slide is to remind us of the various different aspects in soil and not neglect the, the biotic component. There are many different um, there are many different sources of this sort of information. This particular one from Northcliffe North in 2006. 60 times 10. So this is in the top 30 centimeters of a healthy soil. 60 times 10 to the power of 12. 10 billion fungi. A million algae. Over a min uh, 500 million single celled organisms, threadworms, mites, going increasing from microfauna through mesofauna, megafauna, and we might even have, sorry, macrofauna and maybe mega, megafauna like moles um, or patches, even perhaps other animals. This soil health could be indicated by particularly easily by just measuring the amount of earthworms in soil. The humble earthworm, um, even Darwin was fascinated with these, these amazing creatures. But I see that part of this conference was to do with engineering. I thought I'm not natural engineers in the soil. Because of the tunnels they produce, they improve water drainage and also water storage. They provide um, tunnels for plant roots to grow down, which then, then the plant roots add stability to the soil. They help in key stages of decomposition. And there's thousands of different types of earthworms, it's not one type, there's different categories depending on how deep they go. But they too are very vulnerable, not only to plowing, but also to chemicals, including plastics. We hear more and more about plastics and the effect on the environment. Many plastics claim to be biodegradable, 
but they're not they're not truly biodegradable they they break up in smaller and smaller pieces but they don't necessarily degrade because that there's a, a significant increase in micro in, in microplastics in the soil and that has an effect on the worms so this is recent research come out this year from boots and others so with no microplastics below the ground we've got large larger earthworms and correspondingly above the surface we've got more plant growth with the presence of microplastics they showed categorically that the earthworm by the mass of the individual worms on average was decreased and correspondingly there was less growth of plants above the ground and those plastics can come from many of our clothes nowadays not just from plastic bags from the year all about so how does the soil relate to human well-being every ecosystem features key functions such as primary production um, and nutrient cycling which give rise to ecosystems ecosystem services that improve human well-being such as the provisioning of clean water and fertile soils Human well-being lacks a universally agreed definition, but broadly speaking, it equates to the quality of life. I think we all have a clear idea of what we mean by human well-being, but it might not have a universally agreed definition. So it equates poor soil, poor quality of life. reminds us of that um, quote that I started off with from Mexico, the land will be as mankind is. Sorry. One aspect of human well-being is human health and although we all realise the problems of antibiotics um, becoming with antibiotic resistant bacteria we still are searching for more and more antibiotics and many and many of them come from the soil Texiobactin was discovered as a new class of antibiotics in the last decade in soil and there's some examples of other ones there from other um, soil, soil organisms So just to remind us of the this, this functions of soil. Carbon sequestration, water purification, nutrient cycling, habitats of various animals, um, res for genetic resources such as and antibiotics. So our, our food our fibre, our fuel, all come from different, uh, or depend on the soil. There's a table there, which is also in the paper, um, that illustrates this. And I think this quote here emphasises the importance of those microorganisms within to, to achieve all those activities. The microbes are unseen and probably underappreciated. Losses in microbial diversity derived from human activities and climate change will reduce rates at which ecosystems and services are maintained. We tend to take soil for granted. So what can be done? The use of biochar, which is basically achieved through pyrolysis, 
pyrolysis is a way of us um, having one renewable energy, this one renewable energy technology. The result is a biochar which doesn't decompose easily. That can be added to the soil. And whereas under natural conditions, ideally, carbon sequestration by photosynthesis is neutral. The plants um, absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, but obviously various organisms release it through respiration, so it's neutral. But in, including biochar will hopefully result in a 20% uh, reduction in atmospheric carbon dioxide. Various other benefits include a decrease in nutrient runoff, an increase in soil carbon, an increase in fertility, and an increase in the, the structure of the soil, the soil itself. So there's a, a quote here from, from Lau, which is on page 11 of this article. The uncertainty, sorry, the carbon sink capacity of the world's agricultural and degraded soils is 50 to 66% of the historic carbon loss of 42 to 78 gigatons of carbon. This is from Lau in 2004. As well as enhancing food security, carbon sequestration has the potential to offset fossil fuel emissions by 0.4 to 1.2 gigatons of carbon per year, or 5 to 15% of the global fossil fuel emissions. The global soil carbon pool of 2,500 gigatons includes about 1,550 gigat gigat gigatons of soil organic carbon and 950 gigatons of soil inorganic carbon. The, the soil carbon pool is 3.3 times the size of the atmospheric pool and 4.5 times the size of the biotic pool. So there's a huge incentive to increase the use of biochar or another technology called enhanced rock weathering. Enhanced rock weathering is the use of calcium or magnesium silicates added to the soil, as shown in the red arrow here. By increasing those, you get implant root growth, you get improvements in pH, and that also induces weathering within the natural soil rocks that weathering then leaches and passes the carbonates to the ocean, to the ocean, and they, they where they're deposited within the ocean. But spreading the, the, the silicates onto the soil in the first place helps that. And it's, it's supported by organisations such as the World Bank, but in my article I've noted that not everybody agrees on the benefits of this. For example, ActionAid wrote, the uncertainty of the socio-economic, on page 11, the uncertainty of the socio-economic impact of, and the true potential of soil carbon sequestration is expressed by Singh on behalf of ActionAid, who doubts the benefit of soil carbon markets that are biased against smallholders although they're advocated by the World Bank and other large multinationals. I want to show two graphs that are fairly similar. So this graph shows the potential for um, soil erosion if intensive agricultural practices are continued. And you can see that in Africa particularly, and in parts of Asia, we've got very, very red, high level of soil erosion. And more orange down here. But if regenerative agricultural practices are included, 
Yeah. It's difficult to remember the other one in your mind, but this has become perhaps less orange, and this has gone from red, and there's more and more dark green in other countries. This, I mean, so the, the two graphs, I switch back to the first one, and then to the second one, employing regenerative practices. Between the two, we can show that there are opportunities to reduce soil erosion and land degradation. <coughs> Many farmers are only driven to change through economic reasons, um, and This book by a farmer called Gabe Brown from America, very, very readable. He, if you'd like to pass around, Daryl, um, he recommends five basic principles. So, Gabe Brown, minimizing soil disturbances, in other words, going to no tillage agriculture, stop, stopping plowing, basically. Protecting the surface of soils with cover crops. So, historically, over the last 50 years or more, it's conventional in, in, in more temperate climates than here, perhaps. But you expect to see bare soil in the winter. And as rain increases or winds increase, those are very vulnerable to erosion, soil erosion. But it, but Increasingly nowadays, crops are put on just to cover the soil and they can also return nutrients to the soil. Increasing crop diversity is another recommendation, so including more legumes, for example, growing two crops together, integrating animals, but not just integrating animals, but, but following a um, more ecological pattern of grazing, so actually increasing the intensity of grazing for short periods, just like animals on prairies or prairie land in Africa would do, where there'd be this intensive mob grazing and then a reduction or a, a time for the land to regenerate itself. So farmers are looking at using electric fences with automated gates to have a very intensive grazing period and then open a, a, a gate on an electric fence and forcing the animals to move to the next area but very, very quickly. The use of perennial crops to keep living roots in the soil as much as possible. The soil roots release Exudates, so I'm laughing at the soil being passed around to our new. Really, cop. It was a It was a splat all along, by the way. The, the roots of plants release. I, I mean, it's, I can't stress, and I haven't stressed, and perhaps I should have done. The soil is a living ecosystem. Carbon compounds pass from one organism to the next, and backwards and forwards. And it's so integrated, it's, it's very finely tuned. It's been millions of years in developing. Soil as we know it, or as, oh, I'm so sorry. Are you okay? Yeah, it's, it's okay. You keep going, you know. <laughs> Try on my book as well, it's all right. Um, soil as we know it, are, are from, sort of the Devonian period, 400 million years ago, when plant life really evolved and helped soil to evolve to the soil as we know it today. So, by in using more perennial plants in agriculture, we maintain the root system that adds structure and stability to the soil and release those exudates that feed the, the mycorrhizal fungi and other organisms. 
So I just love this next slide. An uh, organization from the Roham, Roham State Research, Rodale, sorry, the Rodale Institute, have developed this, this new grain called Kernza from a wild grain. And it's got these massive roots that last, that, that go down three meters into the soil. And the, the crop produces the grain that has been actually harvested. I hoped to get some for you today, but unfortunately they wouldn't export it to Thailand. I don't know why. Perhaps Donald Trump has something to do with that. So I wanted to get some of this for you. They're selling it very, very expensive, $25 a kilo. But from that, they also have deliveries to various bakeries and produce pizzas. And this one, innovative company that's even producing beer called Long Root Beer. So this isn't just an academic exercise, it's actually commercially viable, um, though at the moment slightly more expensive. So going back to Gay Brown's principles, they also relate very closely to the ideas of doing more organic farming and less intensive farming. He hasn't said don't have fertilizer. He hasn't said don't use pesticides or insecticides or herbicides. Though more and more people are supporting um, organic agriculture, uh, which has many advantages. It does appear to increase soil fertility and organic farming increases soil biodiversity, water retention. It produces premium price products, which is good for the small farmer. And it has less externalized costs. There's less anti antibiotics in the soil. Antibiotics you know, aren't designed to have a short life, so they have a long, a long um, lifetime within the soil and that gives time for resistance to develop and it has an increase in as I mentioned increased biodiversity and increase in numbers of organisms like the dung beetle which suppress E. coli populations um, and increase the rate of the decay of, of, of pig or wild or hog uh, fecal pellets However, it doesn't come without disadvantages, including lower, possibly lower yields, probably lower yields. It's labour intensive. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? <coughs> it's labour intensive, but perhaps that means more jobs for people back in rural areas. The UK, it was very quick to notice in, by the anti-organic lobby, um, oh, more lands will be needed, we can never feed enough people to use organic farming within the UK. However, that seems to um, ignore the point that we actually move to a less meat-intensive diet, less dependency on meat in our diet, we might actually be able to feed people even within a small country like the UK. There's a high cost to the consumer for food, perhaps it's a, real, a realistic cost. Plus the organic farming, we might have shorter shelf life because it won't include um, genetic modified food with genes for long shelf life. And there's claims that it might actually increase um, greenhouse gas emissions overall. I guess again that depends on, I assume, that depends on which type of organisms, or which type of agriculture, whether that's rice or whether that's uh, <coughs> organic farming for meat. There's a possibility of an increase in transfer of pathogens from manure in organic farming. Um, who associated botulism in cattle, Kennedy and Hall, have so found there is a link between botulism in cattle with poultry litter. 
Um, that's just one example. Uh, last year, there was a report out that essentially if we want to feed the growing world population, we really need to move towards a less meat-intensive diet. This report from Springman and the Lancet. The public health approach focused on dietary changes towards predominantly plant-based diets that are in line with evidence on healthy eating performs better in reducing environmental pressures potential nutrient deficiencies and diet-related mortality than approaches motivated only by environmental and food security concerns. Um, I was interested in Australia, which traditionally, I guess you have a very high barbecue diet, you like your meat. There's a, a, been a massive increase in people who've reduced the amount of meat they eat. Um, down to perhaps only once a week or going completely vegetarian. So if it's possible in Australia, I guess it's possible in many other countries too. Another book I've enjoyed reading is called Soul, Soil and Society, A New Trinity for Our Time by Satish Kumar. Satish Kumar, um, originally from, I think, India, now living in the UK, if you'd like to pass that book out or okay. um, Very closely worked work closely with Schumacher, who Schumacher published a book, a very famous book, Small is Beautiful. Such Schumacher extends that work and has developed what's called a small school in the UK, meaning that it's education for all. And He's involved with the Schumacher College. Does a lot of work with the environment, environmental education. Um, his quote from that book, one of his quotes from that book, I like, never mind what happens to our children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren, we don't care. We want short-term economic benefits for ourselves. The way we treat the soil, the land, the way we put animals in factory farms, the way we treat our rivers, air, water and seas and mountains, and the way we cut down forests shows our contempt for nature. We have become totally self-centered. I include this because it's not just the responsibility of the farmers or the land managers to look after the soil. It's down to all of us. Miles and Craddock, um, who was mentioned in one of these other seminars last year, I think it was last year, the environment is impacted by poverty, consumerism, human rights, human health. And they recommend that we move to a, a bioethics that is um, founded on connectivity between different species, Con our connectivity with the environment, our independence, interdependence with other species, our relationships with others, and a sense of shared suffering with our environment. This idea of consumerism, I just would illustrate with one example from the UK, fast fashion. I was done, I can't remember particularly which conference it was, but there was one conference here that referred to 70% of people in Thailand committing that they had clothes in their wardrobe they bought and never worn. Um, in the UK, this is from, from the, the RAP report from 2017, RAP being Waste Resources Action Programme. Shows that the increase in clothing sales has gone up from just under a million tonnes 
to over a million tons, 950,000 to 1,130,000 tons. And the carbon dioxide footprint associated with that for its lifetime, I must admit, it's for its lifetime, so not only includes production but also the washing, has increased from 20, 24 million tonnes to 26, a significant increase in just four years. So, that total footprint, although there's been improvements in technology, which has meant the, there's been a decrease per kilo because of efficiency in production, overall the footprint has increased. The water footprint's gone up by 8 billion cubic metres, and all of this clearly has an impact on landfill, as the clothes are thrown away. The cotton in many of those clothes has a huge impact on soil, cotton production. But we also need to look at the whole life, life cycle length, the, the dyeing of the clothes, the frequent washing of the soil, those are the, the clothes. So consumerism and our hunger for um, modern diets as well that include more and more meat consumption. Perhaps, perhaps we could learn from the humble amoeba, soil amoeba. Daryl, I don't remember, a few years ago we produced a, a, a UNESCO report on ethical production of meat. That's right. And I can remember some, I can't remember who it was, my apologies, but I can remember the person making the presentation and he said he could see no ethical reason to justify eating meat because of its serious impacts in so many different ways. Yes, that's probably Rob Kennelly, the author, but I'll, I'll bring in a flash of coffee. I'll go and get it from the office. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, yeah, perhaps we can learn from these a bit of altruism from these soil amoeba. Soil amoeba under certain stressful conditions, environmental stress, not psychological, environmental stressful conditions, will form a slug. The slug then grows into a stem, and the stem produces like a equivalent to a fruiting body. But the individual members within the stem are sacrificed, and this release is just a few. I'm not saying that as our human population sacrifice um, grows, we should sacrifice a few people, but perhaps we could stem our consumerist behavior. We need to reduce that or limit ourselves. The International Panel of Climate Change report the full title for it is a special report on climate change, desertification, land degradation, sustainable land management, fuel, food security, and greenhouse gas fluxes in the terrestrial ecosystems. I think everybody has heard of the IPCC report, came out earlier this year. And we always think of just climate change and the effects of global warming, rising sea levels but a massive part of this report relates to land migration, soil, land management, emphasizing our importance of, of soil in our lives. So, as I mentioned, I'd like to cover some of the international in initiatives. Early as 2003, um, some organisations recognised or initiated the idea of having a World Soil Day. In 2013, that was decided to be the World Soil Day, it was decided to be the 5th of December, which is actually the former king of Thailand, Bhagavan Adunidet's birthday, known here in Thailand as Father's Day. Um, and that was in recognition for his work 
and through this efficiency economy philosophy on soil conservation and some, to some extent regeneration. So World, World Soil Day was proposed in 2003 and 2013. It was endorsed by the United Nations as December the 5th every year. In 2015, it was the year of soils. And, oh, sorry, don't know what's that. And following the year of soils, the IUSS, the International Union of Soil Science, we uh, proposed a decade of soils. So we're halfway through that decade now. 2015 to 2024. But I wonder how much awareness, how much impact it has had. So in the International Year of Soils, they proposed a post-competition called Soilutions with a thousand dollar first prize, five hundred dollars US dollars for the second and third posters. But they only had worldwide 42 entries. So it seems like there are those initiatives, they are high profile in, in UN circles, but are they really, um, are the general world population aware of them? 45 across the, 42 post entries across the world seems dismal. It's good to see there's the initiative, but needs more publicity. Since then there's been various other initiatives including um, a, a conference roadblocks oh, I'll go back. Sorry. So including various other soil logo competitions and national um, organize, organizations such as CESRA here in Thailand, Centre of Soil Excellence in, in Asia. Um, there's one here called Life in the Soil, Dig Deeper, or Dig It, various other puns on soil names. And in France, they, they, they launched the Four Per Thousand initiative. I'd like to show you a video on that if I can, look at how to do it. sound on this. So this is just from, um, from the... Food is also hard hit by disruption in the climate. However, agriculture can also provide solutions, notably based on soils, which are highly effective carbon sinks. We can start by recording the role soil plays in the carbon cycle. Using photosynthesis, plants capture carbon from the atmosphere and produce oxygen. The carbon is incorporated into the soil by plant roots, or the decomposition of organic matter, mainly in the form of organic compounds. Carbon can also be trapped in the soil, contributing to the absorption of part of the air's CO2. It also enriches agricultural soils, enhancing their fertility and promoting adaptation to climate disruption. The 4 per 1000 initiative shows that by storing carbon in agricultural soils using the right farming techniques, Agriculture can help combat climate change. If the carbon stored in soil were to be increased by 4 per 1,000, or 0.4% every year, this would halt the rise in the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. 
Such action complements efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the economy as a whole. There are agricultural techniques that can increase soil carbon content. This is true of the methods of agroecology. The aim is to increase soil cover and to enrich it with organic matter. Leaving soil bare needs to be avoided by providing permanent cover and limiting the working of the soil, no-till farming, using organic rather than mineral fertilizer, adding intermediate crops between crops and developing grass strips, developing hedges and agroforestry, protecting permanent grassland and optimizing its management, restoring and protecting farmland and degraded soils. At global level, four per thousand aims to enhance the soil's ability to cope with climate change, to contribute to achieving food security, and to limit the rise in global temperatures. Thank you. Thank you. I, 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 I included that because I think it says more succinctly and more flashily than I could. But also, I go back to Gabe Brown's book. He wrote that and he adopted many of those practices back in the 1990s, but not through an ethical or environmental concern at first, but purely through financial reasons. He saw his soil productivity decreasing and decreasing and decreasing, his fertilizer costs increasing and increasing and increasing, and the soil didn't smell the way it did when he was a child. It had changed, its, bio, its biotic content had changed. But as th this is now saying, this initiative I think started um, in the, at about 2015, 2016 maybe, this initiative from, from the French at one of the climate change conferences. And I noticed that now also, the conference that happened just last week in the EC was about soil and the SDGs. Sorry, these are two different things on this slide. Four per thousand, and then this is just to show that they're now actually having conferences at the, uh, within the EC about how to achieve the SDGs if we don't take soil into account. So, it's a it's a very, very important topic. Um, so moving to education, some of the things that I've tried with some of the students, I haven't done a great deal of this, but I thought, oh, you know, there is room in education for um, an in increase in learning about soil and an increase in learning about environmental ethics if we really want to achieve change. It's not just about farmers doing things. Um, changing their practices. So, these students are in year one or year two, there's a mixture of year one and two, and they absolutely loved it. When, as soon as they came in, they were excited to be seeing animals living in the soil, they're enthusiastic, they did little experiments, they sorted out cards. These cards and similar cards that are made, these come from an FAO. You're welcome to pass them around and you're welcome to have a game if you want. Happy Families game, there's the instructions. Sorry, don't. Okay. There you go. Um, that talk about the different types of life within the soil. Um, I got all the students to help these little ones use microscopes to then use them for and the older students were also interested. The, the, the room was a hive of activity. It was um, incredible to see the amount of energy and genuine enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. I mixed it with some songs I won't sing to you, you would like to know, but about Wiggly Woo the worm who lives at the bottom of the garden. Um, and whilst they were doing that, they were shaking some soil 
and letting it settle to find the different layers in the soil. There are so many simple experiments, hands-on activities that kids can do, very, very young kids. And I was surprised that at the end of that session, very quickly, they produced a little thank you. Teachers don't often get thank yous, so I laminated this one. But a thank you, and it mentioned some of the organisms they'd learnt about. And that gives me hope that if, if it is included in curricula, that there could be more um, opportunities for teaching that. I'd like to read some part from this, from page 21 in this paper. In Australia, there is clear guidance on moral development within the national curriculum. There's a requirement to use scientific information to inform ethical decision making over environmental issues such as land use and in technologies curriculum. Students consider the rights and responsibilities to, to protect the planet and its forms. But there's still no specific mention to soils, which are arguably one of the most vulnerable parts of the ecosystem. In the UK national curriculum, soil does get included specifically in the curriculum. Even very young students need to know a little bit about the, the dependence on nutrients from the soil. But again, it doesn't really talk about life in the soil and that how to protect that life is so vital for soil to provide the functions and the ecosystem services. So if I could basically, um, what I'd like to see is more of the principles from environmental ethics, <coughs> they are possibly beginning to be included in some national curricula or in some legislation around the world, including in the UK Environment Bill, from, which is not a law, but it's a proposal to produce a law, the Environment Bill from 2018, I think UK politics has got downhill since then, they've tangled up with Brexit, separate issue. But, um, the, the law that was proposed, the bill that was proposed at the end of 2018 and is possibly in the process of becoming statutory and active go government includes recognition of the precautionary principle, the principle to um, prevent environmental damage, the principle, these are actually stated within the law, the principle that environmental damage should be rectified as soon as possible. The polluted plays principle, the principle of sustainable development, of public access to environmental information, particip public participation in decision making, and environmental justice. So those principles could be quite easily included into um, a curriculum for education. for young students onwards. Reading from page 21 in my paper, surveying some of the issues highlighted in this paper, an approach to the inclusion of soil ethics in the curriculum could be to introduce relevant principles in a systematic manner. The principle of access to information applies to the natural curiosity seen in very young children who could begin to perform simple soil experiments in a participatory approach, experience and learning the benefits of social learning, which is advocated even when the, in the IPCC 2019 report, they advocate the benefits of social learning to address climate change. So if I go back to this idea of year 11, these like 16 and 17 year old 15, 16, and 17 year old students helping the six and seven year old students learn. Um, so this could be measured using horizons. So sorry, but this could include measuring horizons in soil or estimating the fraction of air in soil or various other simple experiments. 
environmental justice can be delivered in the context of a junior students participating in urban agriculture techniques. Also learning the importance of taking preventative action not to contaminate soil. These are discussed by various authors, including McClintock and Sill. Older students can unpack the precautionary principle in the debate surrounding the instrumental or intrinsic value of soil and the associated biota. This, in, this links to the various perspectives taken by different stakeholders by maintaining very small plots of land, even as little as one, one meter square, students could apply some of the principles of soil restoration and remedial action taken by farmers such as Gabe Brown. So, um, here I took the students to a, a centre just outside Pak Chong, the park place. These students, this was a Saturday morning, and we're having a look at the different biomes in this ecology centre. And I said, let's have a game of this, and they tried it out for me. They enjoyed it, you could see they're actually all um, massively smiling, but they did enjoy it, and they talked about it lots. So it's accessible for a wide range of abilities, limited prior knowledge was needed, it was fun and engaging and informative, and it generated questions. So to sum up, healthy soil is rich in biodiversity and performs vital functions. It's essential for valued ecosystem services, which are necessary for achieving many of the sustainable development goals. Intensive agriculture has had a huge impact on the soil and is driven by consumerism. However, regenerative agriculture, using the techniques mentioned, and including carbon sequestration can restore soil. There have been many international initiatives, such as um, the Year of Soils, the Decade of Soils, various other partnerships, the four per thousand are aiming to raise awareness. Hopefully they are effective and with increasing so. But there's a need for, a, for us to refocus our ethical, um, a need for ethical refocus of policies as erosion continues to rise, as I said earlier, 2.5% per year. There's a potential to apply that also to school curriculum across the world to include knowledge and understanding of soil and of bioethics. Thank you very much and look forward to it. Today is the last day of November in five days' time in World, world Soil Day. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Uh, how was the soil tasting? Everybody tried? <laughs> <laughs> Try it with coffee. In the coffee? It was good instead of coffee. <laughs> Lots of hands-on things. Uh, questions or comments, please? <coughs> yes, uh, Hi. Naris, please. Uh, well, thank you for... I normally uh, work <coughs> in this uh, bit of uh, health technology, but uh, <coughs> this is very... Uh, refreshing and I was quite interested because in the one part of your, your talk you mentioned about antimicrobial your resistance we at uh, my organization T cells we have a number of, of projects uh, for that I see some they get some potential collaboration uh, however I uh, am more inspired by uh, you're mentioning of uh, food, meat production, vegetarian, and organic. So uh, I guess I would like to ask questions about those. Uh, what do you think about uh, the hydroponic movement? Now in Thailand, we produce a lot of vegetables without using soil anymore. Uh, do you think that's a great idea? And Number two is uh, in meat production, we are now increasingly capable of producing meat 
without uh, using animals. And we see this uh, in new technologies that <coughs> already commercialized as uh, whole plant converter, like Beyond Meat. Uh, in, we even have uh, shops opening in Bangkok. Very expensive. Um, uh, also, you, you think those are good ideas? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I range in urban agriculture and the use of hydroponics and the use of organoponics, which is growing on, on not necessarily in a water-based medium, but in a uh, more like a foam-based medium. Um, yeah, I think that I great initiatives, although I'm not sure about the about the impact of on water for, for those and and how they, they affect that. I think there's also problems with um, hydroponics that above certain temperatures, about 25 degrees C, ambient temperature, the oxygen solubility within the water decreases. So I know that within Thailand, people have problems producing organic products, sorry, hydroponic products at certain times of the year. Though I think they should be encouraged. And I don't know also about the, the life expectancy of the actual um, hydroponic structures um, because they are often based on plastics and those are prone to light degradation. So whether they have a, lo a long lifespan or not, I, I'm not qualified to answer. But it's encouraging to see more organoponic systems growing vegetables, growing vegetables and herb, herb products around in the uh, part of Thailand where I'm based. I think there's a huge potential to increase urban agriculture and starting off with education in schools, on building rooftops, on, on many other systems. There's a huge, and I think that would be a good thing for people to reconnect with where their food comes from. So, your other question uh, was, re was uh, regarding plant meat, yeah. I, 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 it, great, it sounds like a fantastic technology and I've, I've read a bit about it, I know a little bit about it, not, not a great deal. But I think there's also a, a rich diversity of vegetarian diets that, that you know, you don't need to eat as much meat to have a, um, a very um, healthy and a very um, enjoyable right. diet without without having if meat you substitutes. If vegetar uh, vegetarian, do you think uh, that would be perhaps uh, a step towards people migrating uh, into becoming more uh, vegetarian? Would that be possible? But I think. I, I think it would. It possibly would encourage some people. But I think there are a, um, a more um, pescatarian diet where there's more fish eaten. Possibly might help as well. Uh, less dependence on mammalian meat for, for a start. I think there's just more education on the variety of vegetarian diet, of veg vegetarian dishes that can be prepared would be a good thing. But yeah, I think promoting these would be good, especially if the price comes down, so it's not just the affluent who can be them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Yes, La, please. We have, um, <clears throat> uh, we have two farms, one in Buri Ram and one in Chiang Mai. One in Chiang Mai I had before, and then when I got married, I, my family. Had one. But we converted, we transitioned over to to agroecology and agroforestry. Uh, we put in, you know, uh, uh, compost, high, high grade compost, you know, all that, and then we put in Baltimore, the uh, legume. Mm -hmm. it's, a big, it's a big thing, you know, and it has the nodules on the on the shaft of the. Um, 
And are you finding in Thailand that people are able to convert over? Or you're in, what, where are you located? I saw it's in Thailand, right? Yeah. I, I, I am located in, not far from Buriram. Oh, you're okay. But you're I, I, don't, I, I don't know exactly how, how farmers are, but the farmers that I've spoken to um, say they can't afford to go organic. They, they need to maintain that there's a fear that if they stop using fertilizers, if they stop using pesticides and herbicides, their crop yield will reduce so much that they just cannot afford to. And they don't have markets available for organic products. Although well, they can see they sell more on the shelves. They don't. They haven't got the infrastructure access. access to those markets yet. Um, having said that, this soil came from literally just outside my house, and I've been encouraged to see. Whereas five years ago, they had cassava there grown every year, and then it was bare. Now they're growing cover crops, and I can see the soils getting darker again. But it's only just fine personal observation. Is cassava stripping the soil? I think the... I, I see a lot of it too. I don't think the cassava particularly has its impact. I think it's the cassava agriculture that, that exposes the soil. And then when the rainy season comes, you see massive wash-off right. from the soil. And we don't really get a lot of high-level wind in Thailand, fortunately, for soil erosion. But um, even that, there are periods where this incredible amount of dust comes off in the dry season. I hope that answers. Hi. Okay. Hey. Hello. Hello. Uh, uh, I'm just curious about do uh, you, you have any data on the effect of genetically modified uh, seeds, plants, to soil degradation or soil conservation? Are there any effect to the soil? quality when you plant genetically modified seeds. Like Monsanto distributes uh, genetically modified uh, soybeans and peanuts to be planted by farmers. Is there any effect on soil quality? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't know is the answer to that. Having said that, the kerns of grain that I showed has been genetically Mm. I'm not sure if it's strictly speaking genetically modified, but it's, if it's been bred, but it's from a wild, a wild strain, so it might be bred by traditional methods or by GM. Yeah, I'm speaking of the, uh, the, 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 the one with the long root. Yeah. So just imagine how much water it, it absorbs. Absolutely, yeah. Um, but I, I don't know any more than that. But it does add structure to the soil, so that resists the erosion of the soil and therefore the soil has more capacity to hold water. Water. Yeah. So it's got more water retention, so if the plant is using that water, perhaps there's no that harm. Would be but it would be selective for army because we cannot plant that near other crops because it will be you know, in conflict with other crop crops that produces shorter roots that absorbs less mineral. If you plant it near other crops it will be not good to other crops. So you have to you know, plant it in a place where it is not in competition with other crops. Uh, sure, but it is, a, it is designed to be, it has been developed to be a perennial, so it won't be, a, <coughs> there won't be other crops growing absolutely alongside it. It will be a, a perennial stand. But I'm sorry, I can't answer about uh, you know, other other particular G GM crops. Okay, uh, Dexter, please. Thank you for that very interesting uh, presentation. It's uh, really uh, well researched. And uh, sir, I'm just uh, interested on uh, what is really meant by uh, the health or soil build being healthy is it in reference to its productivity or its total impact on the ecosystem sure. 
shot. The, I'm just trying to find the slide where I used a particular definition of soil health um, for this talk. And there's a slide that I used to define soil health because there's so many definitions soil fertility or soil productivity or soil capacity. So I've tried to emphasize this one relating to the vitality of the soil to support biota so that the soil can perform various functions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Alex. Thank you.